Welcome to the continued podcast adventures of Superhero Speak. But I think many of the people that love this character and that love superheroes in general have used these stories as inspiration to say, you know what, I'm going to do something good in the world. I'm going to make a difference like my hero when I was a kid. That is my fondest memory of it because when, you, when you're doing comic books, you want them to affect people. Right. You bring people to care. You want, you want to strike emotions. And I knew that that clone saga was striking a lot of emotion. Can you yep. imagine uh, Pulp Fiction starring Goofy and uh, Mickey Mouse? I can totally imagine that. <laughs> I'm no sure one, somebody's written that one too. Pounder with cheese in France, Mickey. <laughs> what? <laughs> Boy, ale with cheese, Mickey. Yeah. <laughs> I can totally. See? I, I, would, I would watch the hell out of that movie. Yes, I gladly saw, sacrifice that my, my progeny to you, a mighty Marvel beast. <laughs> <laughs> But Neil Adams is somewhere going, hmm, it's, it's my time. Uh, <laughs> How do you measure success? Hey everyone, you're listening to Superhero Speak, and I'm your host Dave. And John. And this week, boys and girls, JD is off. Um, he is on assignment, looking up some interesting information for us, uh, so we can spread some more rumors next week. But... In the meantime, we have a very special guest for us. Uh, you may know this man from the movies uh, Ride Along and Ride Along 2, or um, he he was on a, a episode of... Uh, he was on, he, he's if, on an episode of Black Lightning. To catch he was a killer. in All to, All to Catch Fire. Uh, yes, uh, yes. The originals. Uh, but he's been on quite a bit. I think everyone is actually really going to know our guest this week as Stephen Sharp, the gambler. In DC's Stargirl, now on the CW. How are you, sir? I am great. How are you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Oh, great. doing good. Um, so, so the, the question we normally like to start off on, and I think you have an interesting answer to this because I've read your bio. Uh, was acting something you always wanted to do? Uh, you know, I had no inkling that this is where my life was leading until later in life. Um, you know, I love. I always loved hamming it up for people and I loved entertaining people and I loved making people laugh and I loved I loved kind of being the center of attention so to speak right mm -hmm. but I never realized that I had an aptitude or even an interest in um in performance and um I look back now and I see some road signs and it makes sense but um it wasn't until later in life that um I kind of found this this passion that I have for performance and acting and and specifically improv so is is that what your friends saw in you when they dragged you into an improv show in 1998 yeah it's funny it's i think i do have one specific friend um his name is scott and for, everybody uh, needs a friend like that i know everybody <laughs> needs a friend like that and it's really an interesting story because um i remember to this day he sat me down at we were went to a bar obviously because we were young men and uh, that's what we did because, I don't know, that was just all that seemed to make sense at the time. is just to go hang out at a bar and drink a pitcher of beer. And I remember specifically sitting there with him and he said, you have to do improv. And I was like, what is improv? <laughs> it's like, you have to do it. You have to do it. And I was like, um, I don't know, man. And what's interesting is that he's actually um, a director of photography. He's a DP. And he was just getting into it at that time. And what's interesting is he convinced me to go to the show and for my birthday. He was one of the people that took me. And then our our careers have kind of paralleled. It's been really interesting. He's a pretty successful um, DP now. He works on a lot of shows. I've seen all the shows that I'm on. Um, but, yeah, they took me to a show for my birthday. And I just sat there in the audience and I was like, wow, this looks, this looks so neat and just very fun. And I – Wanted to try it, and that's what I did. I went to an audition. I had to audition for class. They auditioned like 120 people. They chose 60 to be in their classes. I had never done an audition before. I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, but I think that was kind of to my advantage because it was kind. Of, I was kind of like, I got nothing to lose. So, I mean, the expectation is that I would be horrible. Like, I haven't done this before. So, <laughs> you know, there's only an upside potential when you're walking into the thing, something like with no experience. So, um, that was the beginning of it for me. I was walking in to take those classes. I got accepted to the classes, and I actually performed and helped manage and taught classes at that same theater for 16 years. 
what what was it like the first time? Like, I mean, did the did the classes like prepare you for it? And like, what what was it when you like took your first step on that stage? Yeah. So the classes, what the classes did. So what I really liked about the classes that is that the the classes helped introduce kind of like the philosophy of of improv and philosophy of improv is all about the tenets like um uh yes and in your partner so taking an offer from your partner and um and basically accepting it as real and then adding information to it um to collaborate with them to tell a story and so that's a really great lesson on how to just communicate and so i really bought into that and they taught you how to not to judge your partners and it was a lot of team building stuff and um just really digging into the the fundamentals of improv and then ultimately not judging yourself and so it was more like philosophical like big picture lessons about how to perform on stage and and um, how to be confident and not to allow the audience to judge you. And then, of course, they teach you the conventions of improv. So they teach you the specific games that are unique to their theater um, or the format that they, they specifically uh, present to the audience. My first time on stage, uh, it was a graduation show. So basically, we went to class for, I believe it was either six months or a year. I can't remember how we, how we did it, but it wasn't a long time at all. And um, – I remember the first moment walking out on stage. So I was getting called out to stage. I remember sitting backstage waiting for my name to be called. The, the MC was explaining the game that I was about to play. And I was essentially <laughs> coming in to interview with someone and they were going to change my emotions as I went through the interview. And all I remember was I was so nervous. It was, it was like, Worse than death itself, it seemed like. I was standing behind this door just waiting for this inevitable, scary experience. And what I remember doing is saying to myself, okay, you have to go out there. You have to do this. And you're super nervous. There's no way you can hide it because I was sweating. Like I was like, (laughs) I was, you know, like the physical symptoms had taken over. So it was no longer in my, my hands to hide it. So I said, okay, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to just be a nervous character. I'm going to accept what I'm feeling and just, and just be that and just pawn it off as a, as a character choice. And so I went out on stage and after the show, people were like, Oh my gosh, you were amazing. That, <laughs> that nervous character you did was so cool. That was the <laughs> best thing ever. And like, I never told anyone. I was like, no, I was just super nervous and I just didn't try to hide it. And I learned this really valuable lesson that day about performing and especially improv in front of anything in front of a live audience is like never hide. Just be mm-hmm. honest and be authentic because the audience can see it. They can feel it. And so it's the difference between an audience watching you and going, oh, he's he's really not doing well. He's nervous. And the audience going, wow, he's actually seems like he knows what he's doing and it's just a matter of just accepting how you feel and just not hiding so i learned a really my first experience on stage was a huge lesson for me and then you know over 16 years i i went the exact opposite direction i got to a point where you know each of our shows felt like people were coming into my home and i was the host of a big party that i was throwing and that's a whole different feeling right so right um, that was more of a sense of, you know, like if you're in your home and you spill wine on the rug, you're like, nah, let's keep the party going. No big deal. <laughs> and that's how I, that's how I felt when I was on stage at the end is I got myself to a point where I was like, Hey, we're gonna, we might break some things. We might, we might mess. I might make some mistakes and say something I didn't mean to say, or I might not have a great moment on stage, but you know what? It's my house. So I invited you guys all over. So, you know, <laughs> get used well, to it. Well, in the end, that's what improv is about, right? It's like basically take, you know, something comes up that you didn't plan for and rolling with it, right? That's exactly what it is. Absolutely. So, so I'm kind of curious. Um, you, you had a, re- I'm sure you had a regular job at that point. Yeah. Uh, when your friend took you to that improv show and what did you, what was the reaction of your friends and family when you said, you know what? This is something I want to pursue. Yeah, you know, it, I wasn't, I didn't like make this grand presentation and say, that's it. I'm an <laughs> actor. I'm, I found my calling. I'll, I'm, I, I, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. Um, it wasn't like that. So I basically did both for a long time. I worked in corporate, the corporate world for a long time leading up to, uh, doing improv. 
and uh, I, it was great. I had a good time. I learned a lot. I, what I what I noticed is that improv helped me in my corporate world. It helped me kind of think differently and think outside of the box and not judge my ideas. And that's a really powerful tool um, when you're working for like a marketing company or or something like that. Right. And and so um, there came a point where my corporate job and my desire to do improv kind of started to rub up against each other and they started to provide friction. Um, hold on one second, guys. Uh, can you hear that dinging going on? It's, it's my no. computer. Okay, good, good. Uh, so <laughs> I, got, I had to get a new computer and for some reason, all my text messages are going to my computer uh-huh. and, and I literally have no one ever call me or talk to me or text me. And now all of a sudden tonight at 8.45 p.m., it seems like everybody wants to throw me in a group text and start dinging away. But I'm glad you came here. So I digress. Um, where were we? Oh, so um, what was the question? The, oh, you, the <laughs> your, your, your day job and your acting oh, yeah. started to rub up against each other. Yeah, they started to rub up against each other. And so I actually quit improv. Because it seemed like the responsible thing to do, quote unquote. And um, I was uh, profoundly sad. I was profoundly unhappy for an entire year. And everyone around me told me as much. And so about a year later, almost to the day, um, as fate would have it, uh, somebody called me up and said, hey, you know, I was I was in the, the sound booth uh, yesterday and I saw your picture up there and started thinking of you and I, I wanted to call you. And my first, my first instinct was like, well, why is my picture in the sound booth? That's, that's kind of, <laughs> kind of, it's kind of weird. I've been gone for a year, guys. Uh, but, uh, after we got over that and I figured out why my picture was up, um, I ended up having a drink with that person. Um, we talked about me coming back by the time, you know, my drink was done. I was back at the theater and, um, I told myself at that point, I said, you know what? I really love this stuff. It feeds me on a different level. And if I ever have to make the choice again, I am not going to choose corporate. I'm going to, I'm going to make that poetic choice that people talk about and follow my heart. And about eight months later, eight months to a year later, um, I actually got laid off from my job. I was a creative director at a marketing communications company. I was like, Oh wow, this is, this is like the universe telling me that I'm moving in the right direction. Hmm. And like a, a week later, I got a job offer out of the blue for doing the same kind of work, but better making more money and doing cooler creative projects. And I turned it down. I said, wow. oh. I was like, this is like, now this is universe kind of messing with me. Right. And they're like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm going to turn it down. Cause I, I told, I made this promise to myself. I mean, I was a little younger back then. So like, I didn't know any better. And I think it was the right choice. Right. Because as soon as I made that decision, it seemed like things just kind of fell in place for me. And there was never this opportunity to tell everybody, hey, I'm doing this because it just kind of happened. It just kind of was just this natural, organic um, chain of events that put me in this position. Because as soon as I said, I'm, I'm going this direction, like the theater I worked at was like, hey, would you like to teach summer camp for kids? And I was like, well, you know, does it pay? And they're like, yeah. It's like, cool. And they're like, well, do you want to teach adult class? Because at this point, I've been doing it five or six years. And they're like, do you want to teach adults? I was like, well, does it pay? And they said yes. And then a, a, someone that was at the theater said, hey, do you need a, a gig at night? You can come bartend at my restaurant. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And all these things fell in place. And sooner or later, I ended up getting a full-time job at the theater to help manage, to be the assistant artistic director and to be one of the managers. And then the same thing happened as far as my acting career. Like one day, a friend of mine called me and said, hey, uh, I'm at this audition, and I I swear they're looking for someone just like you. And I was like, well, I don't have an agent. I don't have a headshot. I'm not really an actor. I'm an improviser. And um, and he was like, well, just take a headshot. Come on down and see what happens. And it's it's literally (laughs) the worst headshot I've ever taken. It's just terrible. It's out of focus. It's my entire head filling the entire frame. I think I I don't know what I took it with. It was horrible, but I got a call back for the audition and that means they're bringing me back. And my agent, the the agent signed me because if I book it, they want the commission. They want me on their roster and I still have that agent today. So it was really interesting. It just seemed like as much as maybe I wanted to do it, it also felt like it was very meant to be like 
the the career was was opening a lot of doors for me um, that I couldn't have done by myself. It's it's been it's been really interesting, and I think a part of that is attributed to that um, improv training taught me to be very process focused. So focusing on the process of doing improv as opposed to the product, which is like getting in a show or getting in a cast, just enjoying the moment, being present. And um, I think when people are, you know, I, what I have found is when I've been present about what I'm doing, that the product just presents itself because I've been focused on just doing the process well. Right. I, I think it, I think it's funny that um, you made that conscious decision of the arts over business. And now you're first vice president of SAG after in, in uh, Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> kind of went full circle there, man. Yeah, I I I, I live my life in a, a in extremes. It seems it's like I, I go all in when I go someplace. Yeah, and and not only that, but doing it during a pandemic when everything's in turmoil. So that must have been. I, know. I mean, you didn't expect that in 2019, but. No, I no. didn't. It's, it's a tough time to navigate things, but, um, you know, we're taking it one day at a time. Mm. So I'm kind of curious also with uh, um, doing a show like Stargirl, uh, do you get a chance to do improv anymore or do, and do you miss it? Or, or yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I just watched uh, a documentary – last night about improv and it's called um hold on let me what, what was the documentary called freestyle love supreme mm-hmm. i don't know if you've seen it but it's about um uh, uh wait hold on my wife is telling me what is it anyway look it up it's about the singing troupe of improvisers and it's mm-hmm. really fascinating i love watching um documentaries about improv and last night i was like man i really really miss it um i left my theater in 2015 um just to really focus on my acting career and to put a little more focus on that and then also to just to um, start some other projects that i wanted to do um so my wife and i my wife and i actually met at my improv theater um, she came to take classes and, um, we met, um, in the, in the class system and, uh, and we dated for a while and got married. So my wife, we actually performed together for a little over 10 years on stage. Wow. Um, and so we had our daughter. So yeah. So we're like an improv family. Um, uh, and you still do the buskers, right? Yeah. Like, that's what I was getting to okay. is that. Um, so my wife and I and our two best friends, who are also a married couple, um, and just so happen to be my daughter's godparents, um, the four of us started a troupe called the Buskers. And um, it was it was out of again it was totally out of the blue. Someone asked us to do a benefit show, and they said we love you guys. You guys have ne- have you guys ever done a, a show together? And we we're like. No, we haven't. Between the four of us, we have like a hundred years of experience, you know, like we each have like 20 years going in. And we're like, we've never done it before. So we had two rehearsals together and just kind of talked about how we wanted to formulate the show. And we did this fundraiser event and it was so much fun. It felt like since we're such good friends, it felt like we've been doing it for a long time. So we're like, well, let's let's start a troop. And so essentially what we've done is we started this troop called the Buskers. And we basically do two types of shows. We do, um, we'll do private events. So like a corporate event, if a company wanted to have us come and do a show for, for their place, or we do fundraisers. And so that's what we do the most of. And so if there's an organization that is looking to raise funds for, uh, um, a reputable cause, then we'll come on board and help sell tickets to our show. And they basically get, you know, all the proceeds basically. And, um, and that's how we, that's how we kind of do shows. So we're not associated with a theater anymore. Um, we'll bounce around from theater to theater, Mm -hmm. but, um, we, we feel very, uh, very fulfilled doing, uh, charity events because it's like, it's this really positive audience built into the show. Like everybody's coming to support a cause and everybody's in a good place. And, you know, it starts, I always think that an improv show is like a machine and everybody inside the theater, like the crew, 
the actors, the performers, the audience, the house manager, the stage manager, the MC, everybody's like a cog in this wheel or like this piece of the machine that's all driving towards the goal of having this really magical experience. And when you do a, uh, a charity event like the audience is it's it's so powerful because everybody's there for a good cause which has been a really cool dynamic for our improv troupe so yeah we do i don't do it as much i mean when i was at the theater i performed tuesday night thursday night two shows on friday and two shows on saturday so it was like it was crazy and those are like two and a half hour shows each wow yeah and then and then private shows during the holidays and throughout the year i mean it was it was great. I mean, it was one of those things where you got to, you know how they say, like, if you want to be the master of something, you have to do it 10,000 times. Right. Hmm. Yeah, like, it's like I got there in like six months because <laughs> <laughs> we did so many shows. I mean, that's cool because, uh, I mean, it's, it definitely, I can hear it in your voice. It's something that you love and that you can keep doing it. It's great. I think um, every person should take improv. I think kids should take improv for sure. It teaches them really great lessons about, um, uh, self-awareness and self-confidence and just being kind to people and listening and um, making good eye contact. I think every child should take it and it wouldn't hurt if every single person took it at least once. Cool. All right. So, so obviously I would be remiss if uh, we didn't start asking you a little bit about star girl and (laughs) and the gambler. So, (laughs) so I, I mean, the first obvious question is how did that come about? So, you know, I got an audition for uh, a project that I knew nothing about and for a character that was undisclosed. <laughs> I, I, oh, that helps. That's all I'm operating, well, in the, operating in the dark. Yeah, there's your improv going to work then. Yeah, exactly. And so um, I did an audition. I submitted my audition and um, ran through that process. And uh, I got an offer basically saying, yeah, we want to hire you. And I still didn't know all the details. It's like, oh, you booked that thing, right? <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's awesome. Great. <laughs> Seems like it's going to be a lot of fun. And like <laughs> my my audition piece, I, I, I've told this to some people, and, and it's really interesting. I So the gambler definitely has a specific um, you know style of speech, right? He has a mm-hmm. dialect. Um, he has a cadence. I never presented that to Jeff Johns or any of the showrunners or any of the writers. I didn't present that until I spoke for the first time in episode two. Oh, no, wow. nobody knew what the gambler was going to sound like or be like until episode two. Like, so it's crazy, right? Like my audition was so far removed from what the character became. Um, it's fascinating. And I think Jeff just saw something in me as a person that he wanted in the character, right? And so I got a call from my agent. They're like, you booked it. Um, oh, do you accept the offer? And I was like, well, of course. And as an actor, <laughs> you accept your offer. Um, and 30 minutes later, I got a call from uh, a number that I didn't recognize, and it was Jeff Johns. Wow. And I'm like, what? I thought it was a fake call. I'm like, who's that up to with me? And he gave me the breakdown. He welcomed me to the show. He told me what the show was. He told me everything. He told me about, you know, what inspired the, the show, which is, you know, an incredibly moving story. And um, and then he told me about the character. And he gave me a kind of a lowdown of who Stephen Sharp was and the gambler. Um, just kind of top line. And just, you know, and I was like, I mean, I'm like, is this for real? I got off the phone. I remember telling my wife, I was like, honey, I think, I think this is a big deal. Like, I think this is a big deal. Like, and I was like, let me make sure I got Jeff Johns right. So I'm like looking, I'm like looking up online. I'm like, I, dude, I, I have this guy. I know who, this is the right guy, right? This is who, I, this is the guy in charge of DC, right? This is, this is him. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this is crazy. So, um, that's how, that's how it all went, how it all came down. And then, um, when I reported the set for the pilot, um, Jeff and I started speaking about the character and, um, and kind of flushing out what it might sound and feel like. And, uh, we collaborated on that and landed on what you see on, uh, on television. 
So but yeah, it was one of those, it was one of those moments where I was like, when I spoke for the first time in episode two, like they go and cut, and you're kind of like looking around, going, okay, this, what do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> so because it's looking like to turn back now, guys. <laughs> at what point I've heard you I've heard you describe this. At what point did you decide to make him? And and this is a quote from you: one part riverboat gambler, one part Tony Soprano. And one part Colonel Sanders. Yeah. So Jeff, Jeff kind of helped guide that. Like that's how, that's the visual he gave me to develop the character. Like on my, on our very first phone call, he was like, he's like, yeah, so this character is one part Riverboat Gambler, one part Tony Soprano and one part Colonel Sanders. And I was like, yeah, okay, let's do this. And so we started talking more and then, you know, I always like to say I, sometimes I throw in a little foghorn leghorn in there also. <laughs> uh, you have to. <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, it was it was collaboration. So it was early in the process, but then but then I had to buckle down and, and interpret what does that mean? And because there's this fine line between it becoming a caricature over a mm-hmm. character. You never mm-hmm. want it to be a caricature because again it comes down to that authenticity thing. Like if it's if it's if it's too broad and not specific enough, then people are like, oh, this is, this is, yeah, you know, waka waka as opposed <laughs> to, you know, something compelling. So it was a fine line. And, and Jeff gave me a ton of latitude. He gave me some early direction and then, and then l- really let me run with it. He, he left it up to me, which is a huge responsibility, of course, but um, I appreciated it. It gave me a lot of latitude. And as a, as an artist, it's it's really quite fulfilling to get to work like that. Hey, sorry to interrupt. I hope you're enjoying our interview with Eric Goins from DC Stargirl. But I needed to remind everyone, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Superhero Speak. And of course, on Facebook at Facebook.com forward slash Superhero Speak. And while you're at it, don't forget to check out all the other great podcasts in the Geek World All-Stars Podcast Network. But we have to take a quick commercial break. And right after, we'll be right back with Eric Goins. After these messages, we'll be right back. And I, I've, I've seen clips um, of you in a, uh, in a lot of stuff, and um, uh, and a lot of times you play a tech guy. Uh, but this, I mean, you're talking about a fine line here, and I, I've seen every episode up until the one that probably just aired, I think, last night. And, um, like there's with the rest of the villains, it's really easy. It's like, yes, if you're going against sports master, you're going to get hit. If you're going against Tigris, you're going to get slashed. You're going to like, you, you know, when you're watching a scene with them, you know, what's going to go on with the gambler. He's a strategist and yeah. you play him with this, just this undercut this undercurrent of, of, of menace. And so like when you see him, I, I a scene with him you're like okay i have no idea what he's going to do to these people and you're just sitting there on the edge of your seat going okay like i mean is he going to kill them is he not going to kill them is some is a safe going to drop on that he like set up years ago i mean like you know it's 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 more me- it, it, it's because you don't know what he's going to do because he's a strategist he's good he's like an anti-batman almost yeah and I think that's what makes, for me, that's what makes the character compelling and really fun is that, um, the gambler doesn't have any superhuman abilities. He's got his, his intellect and his, um, and his charisma and, uh, his manipulation. And that's, that's it. And so he has to play. I always, I kind of reckon him to a, a chess player. So he's got to be three or four moves ahead of everybody. And he's going to do what he needs to today to get what um, what he wants down the line, even if that means doing something counterintuitive to what me, m- might be correct. I love that about him, that he's smiling all the time. And, and meanwhile, he might, you know, stab you <laughs> or shoot moment, you with the Derringer or, or shoot you with the Derringer. Mm-hmm. Right. I love that scene. I love that. Um, yeah, I actually it's funny because the impression that I originally got from the character the uh, first time I saw him on the scene, on the screen was uh gentleman thief. Mm. Oh, you I know? love that. Yeah. That's a great way to say it. That's wonderful. Yeah. 
Like I like I definitely feel like he's got a set of rules that he follows, but we haven't been fully exposed to those yet. Well, he's a gambler, right? So right. every game has rules, and I think that that's part of his. That's part of what drives him, right? Because mm-hmm. he, and also he's a big. He's a. I mean, if you, if you follow his his history, he is a big believer in just luck and fate. Like he, that's what kind of brought him to the dark side, so to speak. Is you know a pile of money just fell right in front of him, and he just kind of accepted fate from that day. But there's always rules to games, and I think he's he's strategizing all the time, and you have to kind of have rules if you're going to strategize. Right, right. So, so we're we're talking about the character and and his his uh, mannerisms and and the way he thinks. So of course I'm going to ask the obvious question. I'm sure you've been asked a few times. Um, did you read comic books growing up, and did Jeff give you books to read to get into the mindset of the character? So I grew up loving uh superheroes comic books uh to this day i'm a i'll watch any superhero show that exists like someone the other day asked me what do you think about all these batmans that are coming out next year and, hmm. you know michael keaton and uh, robert pattinson and i was like oh that's more content i love it <laughs> like that's how i see it it's like that's more batmans to watch are you kidding me I love it. I'm not going to get into like who's going to do it better. It, they're going to all do it their own way. I love it. And so I grew up watching like um, George Reeves Superman and Adam West Batman, the old Shazam and the greatest American hero. Like I love those shows. I didn't have a ton of comic books, but as I got older, I really enjoyed graphic novels. Um, but I love watching it on large and small screens. I do love comic books. It's just something I've, I have a, I'm not a collector or, mm-hmm. or anything like that, but I can get lost in them. Jeff did not give me a bunch of like a bunch of stuff to go study and go read. He really left it up to me. I, um, uh, so I did my research and, and went online and found lots of stories about the gambler on the DC websites and Wikipedia and, um, and things like that. So it was really, it's really kind of my responsibility to go and do that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, props for mentioning the original, um, fun, is it, I think, was it Funimation? I forget. Uh, the Shazam t- series on TV, or the, the Captain Marvel and, uh, and the greatest American hero, because like they, they don't get enough, um, props these days. <laughs> it was Filmation that did Shazam. That's right. But, uh, so, uh, and, and this is, just a question I'm sure fans have, and I don't know if you know an answer, any answers to this at this point. Obviously, it was just announced uh, you've been renewed for season two. Yeah. Uh, and it's going to be exclusively on the CW uh, next season. But uh, do you know if that means that the production's going to change at all, or is that going to is that going to stay the same, and you're just going to be on the CW? Well, obviously, they have told me nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but what I do know is that Jeff Johns is still leading the charge. Okay. Um and as far as I'm concerned, as long as is Jeff as long as Jeff's involved and uh you know James Robinson, those those icons of not only Stargirl but you know, DC storytelling, I think I think everything's in good hands, right? I mean I don't mm-hmm. I don't know I don't know anything. Um, I'm sure that's that's definitely well above my pay grade and um, my call sheet number. Right. But um, but I have full confidence that, you know, this is Jeff John's story. I mean, this is so important to him. And I, I've seen how important it is to him. And I don't I, I, I feel confident that every, it's in good hands. Well, the, the show does have a different flavor than the um, other CWDC um, series, because like, the, let's let's face it. The other CW series are CW shows, and yeah. you get the almost teenage angst and the the you know the kind of scenarios that you see on te- on teen shows and um, a lot of a lot of drama. But Star Girl is like it keeps things moving along. You you never have that one point where you start to roll your eyes because every, every time you think you're going to get to that point where you're going to roll your eyes, they just roll right through it. And do it in a way that's fun. And I mean, I would, I would hit see it change. And I'm glad 
to hear that it's going to stay under his um, under his auspices while while it's on CW for now because it it has a an almost unique flavor among all of the CW DC shows right now. Yeah, and that that look and feel and everything about it that is Jeff's vision. Like he described it at the very beginning. He uh, he said it's going to fe- look and feel just like this. And damn it, if he didn't deliver on that in many times over. So. So my son, uh, who's 18, I think for them, for him, this is very high praise. So he watches all the shows too. And he said, when he first watched it, he's like, you know, it's like the other CW shows, but without the, without all the high school hijinks. Yeah. 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 Totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I find it amusing too, because it's a superhero show about teenagers that actually stars teenagers. As opposed to a show about teenagers that stars twenty somethings pretending to be teenagers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was that part of Jeff's vision as well, or? Uh, you know, I don't know what what decisions went into casting and putting okay. who where, so I couldn't really speak to that. But I will say that he put together a group of really compassionate, hardworking people that share his love for storytelling. It's it's so obvious. Everyone on the set got along so well. And we continue to communicate back and forth with each other. Um, it, it, it was a really special group of people, for sure. That's wonderful. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the side bonuses of being on the CW now is that if there ever is another crisis crossover, maybe you get to, like, play two people, like, uh, you know, The Gambler and then Dr. Henry Mayfield from uh, Black Lightning. <laughs> I know. Well, that'd be great. <laughs> Riverboat gambler Tony Soprano type meets scared, timid dermatologist. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, you I've seen your clips. You've got range. I mean, oh, you know, so, yeah, it'd be fun to watch you play off yourself. I would Talk love about that. the ultimate improv. Yeah, I would love that. How do we make that happen? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So so here's another question that you might not know the answer to, but I'm going to ask anyway. OK, um, of course, uh in the comics, there have been two um, Stephen Sharps that yeah. are the gambler, Stephen Sharp the third and Stephen Sharp the fifth. They haven't said which one you are specifically in the show. Mm. Yeah, I don't know either. I don't okay. know if I can answer that question either. I mean, I think I think in some instances they kind of merged all those things together mm-hmm. for the time being, but I don't know where they, you know, I, I don't know exactly. Um, where I fit into that. I don't know if I'm the third or the fifth or it's a good question. Yeah. They, they haven't really done like you get, well, you don't have that many episodes, right? But when you get into like a regular TV schedule where there's 23 episodes, you, they have time to do an, like a full episode of backstory or something on, you know, a villain or something. So maybe you'll get that next year. Who knows? One can hope. Hmm. Right. Well, I, I'm actually kind of wondering that too, because um, of course, at this point, we've only seen up to episode nine, I believe, on the CW, and they keep showing that dang lantern. And of course, oh, yeah. And of course, the gambler was originally enter, uh, was an Alan yeah. Scott villain in the against right. the Green Lantern. That is what I'm really hoping for, for, especially for you, for your character, to have a Green Lantern show up and have that be your nemesis in the show. <laughs> Well, you know, Jeff has said, like, um, he said over and over again, he's like, nothing in the show is placed incidentally. Like, every single mm-hmm. thing they've placed is an opportunity for them to tell a different story. Mm. Right? Oh, yeah. He yeah. said that in the, in the, um, in the media. He's like, if, if you see an article that you recognize, it is there for a reason. It's a potential path for a new story, which I think is awesome. Oh yeah, they they check off check off guns the whole place. I mean, like the the pen is just sitting there in yeah. uh, in a room right now in the pen holder, mm-hmm. and you're like wondering who's gonna walk yeah. in and grab it to sign something. And yeah, so I, I I just one thing like if if they do bring in a uh, Green Lantern and Ryan uh, Ryan Reynolds walks into the <laughs> set, just walk away. Just okay. Walk away. Okay. 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 <laughs> I highly doubt that uh, <laughs> they'll make that mistake twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no. Um, so, I mean, that's that's another question, right? Like, obviously, 
you guys wrapped production on the show a while ago, and it's just airing now on the CW. Um, yeah, last, last September, actually. Right. And with COVID, I'm sure when you begin production again is up in the air. So what do you, what, what do you do with yourself in the meantime while you're waiting? Well, I mean, I, I'm, I, I mean, I'm doing a lot of what probably a lot of people are doing, you know, I'm trying to make heads or tails of how to, how to get through this very challenging time with this pandemic. And, uh, you know, our industry is, is, been affected pretty significantly so you know there's not a lot of projects being shot um i spend a lot of time with my family and um uh, watch star girl every monday night <laughs> or monday afternoon and um i garden i've gotten into gardening um i found out that i'm not very good at it but um i'm, I'm working on it and i'm going to figure out what i've done wrong and adapt and do and do better next season um <laughs> But, you know, just, just take it one day at a time right now and just is really what I'm doing. You know, it's been a lot of fun watching the show get a lot of success. I had an opportunity to do a lot of um, uh, interviews with people who are so supportive and engaged and excited about the show. It's it's really been a, 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 a one of the one of the interesting and most rewarding things about being on the show is being invited into a community of people who are so engaged and so enthusiastic about these stories and these characters and everyone is so nice and caring and giving. Um, it, it was an unintended result. I'd never foresaw this. It's, it's so fun. I, I was saying I, I, um, I garden. So I was, I was on a, uh, I did a video for like a, uh, a Facebook fan page and I mentioned, I was like, well, somebody asked me, well, how I'm spending my time. And so I, I'm gardening and here's, here's my garden. And I kind of went through what I was planning. And mm -hmm. in the beginning, I, I made, I, I made the decision to really, I bought way too many like potato tubers. That's like how <laughs> you start potato plants. And so theoretically, when they all grow in, I'll have like 40 pounds of potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know what to do with that. So I was like, you know, I got like 40 pounds of potatoes going on. If anybody has any recipes, I mean, I welcome them. I got so many recipes from people. <laughs> it's awesome. It is so cool. And I'm just like, that is so cool that people take the time. And people are like, and I'm not just talking about like, you know, make French fries, dude. I'm talking about like my grandmother this is a family <laughs> recipe that my grandmother always made, and I'd like to share it with you. And you're like, this is so special. Um, so just really engaging with the show and engaging with people that are interested in the show is taking up a lot of my time right now, which I I couldn't I couldn't enjoy I couldn't enjoy more. You do, uh, you don't mind watching yourself on uh, TV? I, obviously, you don't have Adam Driver syndrome, so like, no, uh, I love it. <laughs> I mean, I love it. I love watching things that I'm in. I mean, you know, I get to watch it with my family and that's exciting for them. And I get to watch it through their eyes, you know, and, and, and see their excitement as, at seeing me on the screen. I, I've always, you know, I, I work with actors and, you know, my philosophy is if I want, if, if I expect other people to watch it, I should probably be able to watch it myself, you know? Right, right. How does your, I'm kind of curious, how does your daughter react? To seeing you on TV, she really enjoys it. She gets a kick out of it. She's mm -hmm. so she has so many questions. Um, uh, she gets really into the show, and so like sometimes she's like, "Okay, I'm getting scared. I'm getting scared. I'm getting scared." <laughs> um, and, and she's like, "What's happening? What's happening? What's happening?" But it's fun. She's having a good time. Um, she loves Sammy. She thinks it's cool. She uh, she tells her her friends uh that I that her dad's a super villain, which I have to explain over and over again. <laughs> but uh yeah, it, it's all fun. I mean she knows it's it's just a story on television and you know it, it's hard when you tell your, your kids that you're an actor. They don't really it, they don't really grasp that. And right. but when they can see you on T V you can kind of put a that's what daddy does. I I do that. See I tell I tell stories. And um that's a cool that's a cool thing to share with your family for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I have to share this that, uh, so we've been doing this show for seven years now and, um, I've interviewed, we've interviewed, you know, hundreds of people and, uh, I always talk to my son about the show and when I told him, oh, you know, we're going to be inter interviewing the gambler from, uh, Stargirl, he was like, wow, really? <laughs> <laughs> so 
So yeah, he thinks you're cool. So that's oh, there good. you go. <laughs> that's good. Let's score one there. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I think it's it's probably it. He definitely had Jeff definitely had a great vision for this because it's definitely I think one of the best, if not the best, superhero show on TV uh, in a really long time. And you know, it's everyone I think on the show does a great job and. You know, when you watch that that pilot episode and they have Joel McHale on there um, as Starman and he gets killed in the on the pilot episode, you're like, okay, this is something different. This is going to be something special. Isn't that amazing? Isn't yeah. that amazing? I know. Even the, the first the first sixty seconds of the pilot, I think you look at it and you can tell it's going to be a little something different. I mean, it's an intense like scene. That very first scene in the pilot, it's pretty intense. What's it? What's it like filming stuff like that and then going back and watching it? Because obviously there's no special effects while you're doing it. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, I would tell you that first scene, that first pilot, the the first scene in the pilot, that mm-hmm. um, kind of like the the big fight in the the JSA. That's that's a lot of practical stuff. It's not a lot of CGI. I mean, obviously, wow. like obviously, like. Um, you know, the stuff coming off the staff and, and right, right. The, the obvious things are de- like the green from the lantern and things like that. Um, obviously, those are all uh, special effects. But like the room is real and all the stuff falling from the ceiling and all the pillars and columns falling over and breaking in half. That stuff's real. Like it took it took like three days to shoot that one scene. Oh, wow. And, and everything was timed perfectly. I mean, I had nothing to do with it like i have a a stunt double who did all the heavy lifting and he was amazing so i sat in a chair and and watched um but it was amazing what these what this team did i mean they had every single move timed perfectly like a symphony of activity going around the room and it's around in a circle too so like you know, Luke runs in and then you kind of go around in this big circle and Wildcat's jumping off backwards and um, uh, Starman's on a harness. Right. So like you can see him fly like it is crazy. And they, they worked on it. They worked on it for like three days, just just kind of rehearsing, mm-hmm. going over, it, going over, it, going over. It. And then the explosions are real. Like oh, those wow. are practi- those are practical explosions. So, you know. It was like, okay, anyone who doesn't need to be here should step off, and they practiced and practiced and practiced, and it was time to go. I think, I think they only shot it a few times because they had practiced it so much. But it was, it was a, it was an, it, it was one of the more amazing things I've ever seen in this industry. Watching something that big and um, get put together and shot, like it was, it was really cool. But then, like there are, but like some of the CGI, like the other thing is like. As, as they're driving up, like when, um, when Luke is driving up to that mansion at mm-hmm. the very beginning, a lot of that is, is, um, special effects. And so I remember seeing that, um, that house, that big mansion, um, in real life. But to see what they did with the CGI as far as like the green effects and people getting thrown out of the building, that was, that was really cool. It's really cool to see what they, what they layer on top for sure. But you'd be surprised to know how much of it is like real, like it's all practical stunts and um, and and practical activities. That, I mean, that, that's that's actually really cool, and I think I think you can tell, and it's probably one of the things that makes a difference about the show. Where, um, I mean, no offense, because I love the Flash, but like, uh, you can tell that that CGI Barry every time he's running now yeah. on the show. And well, it's, it's gotten better, but <laughs> it's gotten better. Yes, yes, I will say that. But it's just like, ah, uh, you know, and and when your power is running fast and you do it every week, after a while, it's like, okay, yeah. um, it's the same, it's the same uh, CGI guy again. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did a great job on Stargirl with with um, balancing those elements of the show. Um, it's it's really cool to watch. Cool. So, so as an actor, um, is there anything that you, you know, besides obviously playing the gambler, uh, is there any, any roles you haven't played yet or anything you'd want to do, um, you haven't gotten a chance to yet? 
Oh yeah, I think I think that's part of the the allure of being an actor is that you know you, you never do it all, right? There's always something out there that 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 speaks to you and that's compelling. Um, I, I think I'd love to be a part of a um, uh, retelling of a of a real story, uh, uh, an important story in history, whatever that might be. I think that would be um, a really cool opportunity is just to be a part of some kind of historical event and telling the, telling that kind of story and be a part of that storytelling. I think that would be pretty cool. Cool. So and, uh, any, and anything comedy. I love comedy. So any you put me in any kind of comedic um, experience and, and I'm just happy as can be. Uh, so well, right, just, just wait for the singing episode then. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> I was going to say, so right along three. Is that? Oh, oh, no. you, wouldn't that be awesome? I would love that. Please. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Yes. So, so Kevin, get on that right away. Let's... Yeah, right. Please. <laughs> Mr. Hart, please. please. Uh, he's from Philly, too, so I can call him Kevin. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great. I just I just want him to do the show. So I'll call him Mr. Hart all day. Uh, it was a, that was a great experience. I mean, Kevin Hart is such a great person to work with. And um, he, he is he's really full of energy and funny, just like he portrays on screen. I mean, that is that's his energy. It's it's refreshing and a lot of fun to work around. Um, he was in the, uh, I believe, the Guinness Book of World Records for largest audience at a comedy show. He did it at the uh, Lincoln Financial Field here in Philly. That's Not awesome. that, like like two or three years ago. And uh, um, obviously, I watched on Netflix. I I can't afford to go to stuff like that. And uh, yeah, yeah, I uh, yeah. I just I can't I can't imagine. Doing stand up in front of an audience that big. Right. I mean, I did, I did, I did an improv show in front of 12,000 people once mm -hmm. and it was pretty challenging because it's like, you, you know, for our show, I was like, there's no chance I'm entertaining everybody here. So like, I'm just going to focus on like the, the 30 people right in front of me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> make sure they're laughing and just in my mind, I'll just. I'll just envision everybody is having a good time. But yeah, I can't imagine uh, doing stand up for a group like that. I think at that point you just, you just do it. Right. Yeah. I'd have to imagine that's what he did. He just went out on stage and it's like, I'll just do it. So, yeah. so actually that actually brings up an interesting question too, right? So obviously when you do improv, you're in front of an audience and you're getting instant feedback. Um, and then when you do something like star girl, uh, you're not getting any feedback until it airs. Um, is that as somebody who loves improv and loves entertaining, is that something that's difficult for you? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's the, the big difference between live theater and working in uh, a different medium like television and film is that, you know, a live performance, there is that immediate feedback and that's, that's so so awesome. I mean, there's no substitute for that. Um, I would say that um, on Stargirl, I, I think because most of my scenes are with the ISA and um, there was a certain element of, of feedback. It's not like immediate, but like when the scene cuts, we knew each other so well that we could talk about it and discuss it. And um, if we're having a good time, that's usually a good sign. Like if we're joking around and having fun and we did a lot of that. So, you know, throughout the season, I think while it wasn't that immediate, like, you know, rarely on a TV or movie set, you know, is it kind of like, hey, great job. Way to go. Because mm -hmm. nobody has to, we don't, you don't have time for that. You got to keep moving. It's important to move fast. Um, and uh, also, you don't have a ton of people that are there necessarily being entertained. People are there working very hard to make a product. Um, but with the ISA, it was really refreshing because we were all together and, and you've got a little bit of feedback because we were just having a good time together. But it is a challenge. It's it's always a challenge. And I think I think the way I deal with it is when I'm on a TV or a film uh, set, um, as opposed to being on stage in front of a live audience, I, I just I try to make sure I'm enjoying myself. Like I'm being true to myself. I'm I'm telling my part of the story in a very honest way. And and make sure I'm enjoying the experience because I think that shows on camera. And I think that's the only way you can gauge your work on a set sometimes is, 
am I enjoying it? Do I believe it? Am I, am I having a good time? And am I telling the story the way I want to tell it? Am I, am I presenting my best self, so Mm -hmm. to speak? And if you are, I think that's a good litmus test for, um, for that feedback that you're looking for. At least it is for me. Cool. So, um, actually one of the ways that we sign off, the way we sign off the podcast is, uh, (laughs) we say, uh, don't let your kick, uh, don't let your cape get caught in the door. And that kind of started off as a joke, but as, as, as time went on, it's kind of actually morphed to mean don't let your shortcomings or foibles get in your way of your success. So what's a shortcoming in your life or something that you've had to overcome, uh, to reach a goal? What, what, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what is something that I've had to overcome to reach a goal? That's a great question. <laughs> you know, I I think prior to becoming an actor, I think I struggled for a long time to find a life path, so to speak, that really fulfilled me. And so as a result, I ended up trying a lot of things. And when you try a lot of things, sometimes you can interpret that as failure. And so, you know, I was, um, I went to school and I was pre-med and I have a bachelor's of science in biology, but I didn't go to med school. And so instead of that, I started working in the restaurant industry. And then after that, I worked in, um, uh, event marketing and I traveled with Ringling Brothers for a year and, and went around the country and did event marketing. And then I did, I managed event marketing and then, and then I worked at Coca-Cola and Home Depot and I was an EMT and I, I took the LSAT, but then I didn't go to law school. Um, I was a real estate agent for two weeks and, and kind of walked away from that. And, and that can be, that can, that can, when you do that for a number of years, and, and I mean, I did that till till I was almost 30, I think, that, that can take a toll because you just can't find your way, so to speak. You can't find something that fulfills you. Mm-hmm. And it was becoming like this ongoing joke, I would say. Like if I was working at something for three years, is kind of like was my time frame. I was like, okay. I'm probably going to get the itch to do something else. This is probably not going to work out. And um, I think keeping your head up and staying positive in those situations and just knowing that, hey, eventually I'm going to find that thing that drives me. I think that that has been kind of like the biggest learning experience for me is on the other side of all that. I realized that having those experiences and doing all those things, even if it was for a short time and even if it didn't make sense at the time, it really molded me into who I am today. And so I think looking back on it, I think I can see that everything I did had a reason. I just I couldn't see it while I was in it. And mm-hmm. it takes a little bit of age and experience and, and kind of just life to look back and say, oh, yeah, everything I was doing was enough. And then as an actor, I think um, it took me a while to, to recognize this and I had to take a hard, a bunch of hard knocks for it is that, you know, all that life experience that I brought to the table of all the different things that I did when I was younger and brought me to who I am today, all those things, that's totally enough. Like I am enough. And learning that lesson as an actor is a, is one that you want to learn pretty quickly because, you know, as an actor, you can, really get into that wheel about trying to please people and trying to figure out what they want to want you to do and how you want you, how they want you to attack the audition. And, and it took me a while to, to understand that. And so that, that was all kind of together working through those things and understanding that what I did as an earlier person, you know, it all served a purpose. And then um, it actually created a situation where it, it, what I, what I have is enough. And um, I can move forward with that and be successful. So hmm. that would kind of be my answer. I don't know if that's that was in the ballpark of what the question was, but it's kind of inspired me to say that. It's the right answer for you. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a good one. So, um, all right. Well, actually, we are at an hour. So um, the question that we normally wrap up on, and it kind of leads off of what you just said, is. How do you measure success? That's a great question. Um, 
I'll tell you how I measure success. And I measure success by the love of the people around me that I feel from the people around me and the relationships that really matter. I think um, uh, when I start putting uh, my measures of success on uh, how many auditions I get or how many jobs I book or how many guest star roles I book, I think that's a slippery slope because I don't control a lot of those things. But what I can control is the things I do every day and the people around me. And if, if, if the relationships I have around me are strong and healthy and um, I have a lot of you know, good people in my life, that's, that's how I measure my success. So that's how I hang my hat every day is, is um, do I have good people? Did I do a good job today with the people that I love? And, um, and is my, are the things that are important to me, are they still at the top of my priority list? Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a very good answer. Thanks. Um, cause that's actually, you know, it's a trick question, right? Yes. No, no, that's how I, <laughs> that's how I feel. So I, yeah. I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, yeah. cool. So I guess, uh, you know, can you tell the people where they can find you online so they can follow you? Yes. I am on the interweb at, um, of course, you can find me on Instagram. That's probably the best place. And I, my handle, I guess that's what you call it, is the underscore Eric, E-R-I-C, underscore Goins, G-O-I-N-S, incredibly creative. Um, the underscore Eric underscore Goins uh, is my Instagram handle. And then my website is uh, ericgoins.com. So, those two places are the best places to find me online, and um, I look forward to meeting a lot of new people. Come, come check, check it out. Yes, and and send him lots of potato recipes. I could use some <laughs> potato, yeah, more potato recipes. <laughs> I got I got cucumbers coming too. So if you can work cucumbers and potatoes into a single recipe, that's a oh. bonus. Uh, th- this is COVID. You need a sourdough starter, man. I have it. <laughs> I learned to make bread <laughs> over over this pandemic. I'm telling you, I'm I'm becoming self sufficient. It's been great. I even made the bread without yeast. Like I made it once mm-hmm. with um with just using other like other things to make the dough rise. Yeah, it's great. And, oh, yeah. and stuff from your garden, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sand and mud. No. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice garden. I've got one of those too. <laughs> a potato cucumber loaf. I could see. Yeah. That. Oh yeah. Potato cucumber loaf. <laughs> Love it. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, John, if you don't have anything else to add, I think we can put a pin in it for the week. No, I'm good. Right. Well, thank you, Eric, very much for joining us this week. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun talking to you. Yeah. You too, man. And boys and girls, as always, thanks for listening, and don't let your cape get caught in the door. Have a good week.